start? Uh, yeah, I think we're getting uh, we close enough. That's it. Good. Okay, so you all set, Derek, to begin. Yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, thank you all for coming uh, after our little break for the for the northern summer. We're getting the seminar underway again. Um, so it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. He's uh, Derek Keelty, who's uh, coming to us live from, from Chicago. Um, he's going to talk about degeneration of the spectral gap with negative Robin parameter. Thanks, Derek. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's great to be speaking in a seminar halfway around the world. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about um, a paper I wrote earlier in the summer. So um, if you're interested in that paper, you can find it on the archive. It has the same title as the title of the talk, or you can just look up my name and it'll be the most recent paper on there. Okay, so, um, so to begin, I just wanna talk about what is a spectral gap and um, one interesting way you should think about it. So, um, so one interesting way you can think about it is to think about it in the context of the heat equation. Um, so, uh, so if you have some heat distribution, U governed by the heat equation, and you suppose you're in some situation where the Laplacian has discrete spectrum, then you can do uh, the usual spectral expansion of your solution of the heat equation. And so what this tells you is that um, your heat distribution looks like a constant times E to the minus lambda one T times the first eigenvalue plus, um, a uh, small correction as t goes to infinity. And so you, you should think about this as saying for large times, your heat distribution, the profile of it looks like the profile of the first eigenfunction. And so um, you can ask a, a more refined question and ask uh, um, what is the rate at which the profile of this heat distribution converges to the profile of the first eigenfunction as t tends to infinity. And so one way to answer this, or to try and answer this, is to um, take your heat distribution U and multiply it by E to the lambda one T, and then subtract off an appropriate multiple of the first eigenfunction. And if you calculate that quantity in L2, then what you find is that it's bounded from above by a constant times E to the minus lambda two minus lambda one T as T tends to infinity. And of course, lambda two minus lambda one is the spectral gap. So this gives you an interpretation for the spectral gap, which is that it's the rate at which the heat profile converges to the first eigenfunction. function. And so one answer to our question is um, to obtain lower bounds on the gap, which gives you a lower bound on this convergence rate. So I'm gonna be thinking about um, spectral gaps in the context of the Roban eigenvalue problem. So the Roban eigenvalue problem is the usual Laplacian eigenvalue problem in the interior of a domain D. And um, you take the Roban boundary condition on the boundary. And so what that says is that the normal derivative of your eigenfunction um, plus some multiple of the eigenfunction itself has to equal zero. And precisely which multiple is determined by this number alpha, which I'll call, which people typically call the Roban parameter. So there's um, one nice way to think about what the Roban boundary condition does, and it's, um, it's that it interpolates between the two well-known boundary conditions, Neumann at alpha equals zero. And then in the boundary condition, if you divide by alpha and send alpha to plus infinity, formally you obtain Dirichlet boundary conditions. So as soon as you're on a, a bounded domain with Lipschitz boundary, these kinds of problems have discrete spectrum of eigenvalues that accumulate only at plus infinity. And um, the first eigenvalue is simple. So in particular, this means that the spectral gap is always a positive quantity. Okay, so now I just wanna mention um, two of the well-known lower bounds on um, 
the spectral gap. So those are for alpha equals zero and infinity, which are the Neumann and Dirichlet problems. Uh, so to start, you take this interval i, which is the interval that has length equal to the diameter of the domain. And the theorem, the first theorem is by Payne and Weinberger from 1960. And it says, if D is a convex domain, then the spectral gap of this convex domain when alpha equals zero, which is Neumann band definitions, is bounded from below by the spectral gap of the appropriately linked interval, interval again with Neumann band definitions. And um, you can compute what that number is. And then the next theorem much more recently is due to Andrews and Clutterbuck in 2011. And it says it's the Dirichlet analog of um, the inequality. So it says the spectral gap of a convex domain with Dirichlet boundary conditions is bounded from below by the Dirichlet spectral gap of the, of the interval. And one interesting thing to note about that inequality is the techniques used to prove this inequality are is um, the heat equation interpretation of the spectral gap from the previous slide. And in both of these cases, we know that equality is attained in the limit of rectangular boxes collapsing to a line segment. So we know both these inequalities are sharp. And so now I want to talk about um, what happens when alpha is between zero and plus infinity. Um, so we know some things, but in general, this is an open problem conjectured by Andrews, Clutterbuck, and Hauer. And it says, whenever alpha is between zero and infinity and D is a convex domain, then the spectral gap of the convex domain with Roban parameter alpha is bounded from below by the spectral gap of the interval with the same Roban parameter. Okay, and again, um, so we, we know this holds for rectangular boxes. And again, equality is attained in the limit of rectangular boxes collapsing to a line segment. And this was shown by Richard Logason in 2019. And at the bottom of the slide, I did a, a numerical calculation in MATLAB for a trapezoid. And um, so in this figure, the the blue curve is the spectral gap of the trapezoid for various values of alpha. And the red curve is the spectral gap of the appropriate 1D interval for the same values of alpha. And you can see the conjecture holds at least numerically for this trapezoid because um, for each value of alpha, the red 1D curve provides a lower bound for the blue curve. Okay, and so um, the main question we're gonna be talking about in this talk is not the Roban gap conjecture itself, but could this conjecture hold when alpha is negative? So when you're outside of this interpolating regime. And what I showed is that uh, the gap conjecture fails to extend to alpha negative. So the way I did this was to construct a particular sequence of domains and compute the spectral gap in the limit of that sequence. And so the sequence of domains, I call them double cone domains and denote them by D theta. So um, I wrote you a formula basically for what these domains are, but um, graphically they're, they're easy to think about if you think about taking two truncated cones with opening angle theta and sticking them together. And then what I'm gonna do is take theta to zero. So the domain um, collapses to something one dimensional in some sense and compute the limit of the gap. So what I showed is that if alpha is negative, then the spectral gap of these double cone domains tends to zero as theta tends to zero. And moreover, um, the spectral gap of the double cones is exponentially small in theta. Okay, and so if you think about um, what this means for the Roban gap conjecture, well, we know the spectral gap of the double cone, sorry, this thing, hopefully that'll stop popping up. 
the spectral gap of the double cone um, gets arbitrarily small. So for a sufficiently small theta, it'll eventually be less than the spectral gap of the interval. Because as theta tends to zero, these double cone domains have a fixed diameter. And this tells you the Roban gap conjecture does not extend to alpha negative. Okay, so um, maybe I'll pause briefly if there are any questions about um, any of the notation or if anything's unclear. Yeah, I should say if anyone does have questions, then uh, just raise your hand uh, at the bottom of your screen and we can unmute you to ask it. Thanks. Okay, so um, in that case, I'll move on and I'll give you some heuristics for why you should. Um, oh no, I have one more picture, sorry. So, um, so this is the same theorem from the previous slide. And again, I, I did uh, some simple numerics in MATLAB. So I computed uh, the gap for various values of um, alpha and for a fixed value of theta. And so um, what you find in this case, in contrast to the previous set of numerics is that um, once you go to sufficiently negative alpha, um, the blue curve, which is the curve of gaps for the double cone domain dives below the red curve, which is the gaps for the 1D domain. And so from this, you can see numerically that this gap inequality does not hold. Okay, so now I wanna talk about um, why you should expect the double cone domain to have a small gap in the first place. And so the intuition for this comes um, from the infinite cone of opening angle theta, which I'll denote by script C theta. And so um, there are a couple interesting things that happen when you um, think about the Roban Laplacian on C theta when alpha is negative. So the first surprising thing is that um, this domain actually has eigenvalues when alpha is negative. And so this is slightly surprising because it's an unbounded domain but it has eigenvalues anyway. And so um, something else interesting happens and it's that uh, you can actually calculate the ground state exactly. And so, um, so this is the ground state, it's a decaying exponential. And so since it's an exponential, it's definitely an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. And this infinite cone is simple geometrically so you can calculate normal derivatives of this uh, function and check that it's actually an eigenfunction. And so something that's gonna be really important for us is that um, if you take this ground state and you L2 normalize it, then it concentrates at the vertex of the cone as theta tends to zero. And in two dimensions, we know um, we know even more, we know that all the eigenfunctions concentrate at the vertex as theta tends to zero. And this was done by Khalil and Pankroshkin in 2016. Um, so a little bit of intuition for um, why you should expect um, this kind of concentration is that you can think of the Roban boundary conditions as um, like having the Laplacian plus a potential, um, which is a delta function potential concentrated on the boundary and of strength alpha. So when alpha is negative, this means you have a negative potential. And this tells you you have an attractive potential on the boundary. And so you should expect your eigenfunctions to stick to the boundary and maybe prefer the vertex to other parts of the boundary. Okay, so now that um, we have this concentration idea, uh, what does this tell us about the double cone domain? So um, since for the infinite cone, you expect concentration at the vertex as theta tends to zero, and the double cone, you expect concentration at um, both vertices. And so 
um, what this tells you is that you expect the eigenvalues of the double cone to be approximated by the eigenvalues of the disjoint union of two infinite cones as theta tends to zero. And so what you should do is you should ask, well, what is the spectral gap of the disjoint union of two infinite cones? And since it's the disjoint union of two domains, you expect the ground state to be degenerate because you could have um, this exponential ground state on one copy of C theta, zero on the other. And then if you swap those, you get a, a second linearly independent eigenfunction. So this tells you the spectral gap of this disjoint union is equal to zero. And if you believe this heuristic that the eigenvalues of the double cone are approximated by the eigenvalues of the disjoint union, then you expect that the spectral gap of the double cone should tend to zero as theta tends to zero. And so the way we're going to prove this um, is by a trial function argument. Um, so if you want to upper, so we want to prove an upper bound on the spectral gap of the double cone. So first we'd want an upper bound on lambda two of the double cone, and we'd want to show lambda two of the double cone is smaller than lambda one of the infinite cone plus an exponentially small error. And we want a lower bound on lambda one um, in terms of lambda one of the infinite cone and an exponentially small error again. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna move on and dive into the proof of the simpler of these two inequalities, which is the upper bound on lambda two. Okay, so, so to get this upper bound on lambda two, we're gonna make a trial function for um, the second eigenvalue. So, um, so remember phi theta is the ground state of the infinite cone. So what we're gonna do is multiply by a cutoff function chi and transplant one copy of these cutoff ground states onto each vertex of the double cone to make this trial function psi theta. And so um, you should think of this cutoff function as being one on this red part of the infinite cone, which is up to the horizontal value one minus epsilon. And then to the right of um, x equals one, the ground state will be zero. Uh, the, the cutoff function will be zero. And so if you want this function psi theta to be a valid trial function for lambda two, you need that psi theta is orthogonal to the ground state of the double cone. And so to show this, you make a, a simple symmetry argument. So first you, you notice that the double cone is symmetric about the y-axis. And since the ground state is positive, this tells you that the ground state will also be symmetric about the y-axis. But since in my definition for um, psi theta, I chose a minus sign here, psi theta will be um, orthogonal to the ground state since it's anti-symmetric. And I forgot to draw this in um, to my diagram, but F and G are just these rigid motions that are gonna take this cutoff ground state and transplant it onto each vertex of the double cone. Okay, and so now we can um, make a, a pretty straightforward trial function argument. So since psi theta is a, a trial function for lambda two, we know lambda two of the double cone is gonna be smaller than the Rayleigh quotient of um, the double cone evaluated on psi theta. And since psi theta is nothing but like two disjoint copies of um, this cutoff ground state, we know this is gonna be the same thing as the Rayleigh quotient of the infinite cone evaluated on the cutoff ground state. And now you have to remember that this cutoff ground state on the infinite cone concentrates at the vertex as theta tends to zero. So since um, our cutoff function is one in um, most of one half of the double cone, this means sort of all the action of phi theta is happening within that region. And you can 
um, ignore the cutoff function up to some epsilon exponentially small errors. And what you find is that this is bounded from above by lambda one of the infinite cone plus one of those exponentially small errors as theta tends to zero. Okay, so this proves our um, upper bound on lambda two. And so now I'm gonna move on and talk about the lower bound on lambda one. So um, as is typically the case for lower bounds on eigenvalues, uh, lower bounds are usually harder than upper bounds. So it'll require some more work. Okay, so for the lower bound on lambda one, um, we start off with this uh, sort of interesting trick. So if phi and u are ground states of c theta and d theta, I'm suppressing the sub theta here because the notation just gets a little too heavy. Um, and then I'm gonna define this um, weighted version of the Laplacian that I'll call the tau Laplacian. So it's one over tau times the divergence of tau times the gradient. And in this case, I'll make this particular choice of tau equals phi squared. And then I'm gonna make this ratio V equals uh, U divided by phi, and I'll restrict everything to the left half of the double cone domain, which is this shaded part here. And if you do this, um, something interesting happens, and it's that um, this ratio of eigenfunctions V turns out to be an eigenfunction of the weight of, uh, of the tau Laplacian. And the eigenvalue mu one is um, the difference of the eigenvalue. So it's lambda one of the double cone minus lambda one of the infinite cone. So now remember, we wanna get um, a lower bound on the eigenvalue of, the, infinite, of uh, the double cone in terms of the eigenvalue of the infinite cone. So it suffices to get a lower bound on this eigenvalue mu one and show that it tends to zero as theta tends to zero. Okay, so, um, so this sounds good, but um, there's a couple complications we'll have to deal with. So we're trying to show some convergence of an eigenvalue. So you might hope that there's some kind of um, well-defined limiting problem, but it's actually not really clear. And it's because, um, uh, this blue shaded domain, which I'll call T theta, this truncated cone, um, it's collapsing to something one dimensional in some sense. And if you look at the boundary parameter in this problem, it's alpha divided by sine theta over two. So it's tending to negative infinity as um, theta tends to zero. And our weight in our weighted Laplacian tau is concentrating at the vertex of this. Um, domain. So um, we've got to sort of unravel these sort of collapsing aspects to this problem. And so the first thing to do to do this is um, to do what I call a push out of the problem on T theta to a radial problem on a spherical sector. So I'll explain more about what that is on the next slide. And then after that, we're going to take this problem on a spherical sector and extend it to, a, um, to the whole ball. And then we'll rescale the ball into a large ball after that. Okay, so um, let's talk about what this push out idea is. Um, so my push out map is gonna be um, this map P and it's gonna send our truncated cone T theta to a, a spherical sector S theta. And I could write you a formula for what this map P is, but um, it would be a little messy and it's not hard to describe what happens in the words. So the way you should think about this is you should take line segments connecting the vertex of T theta and connecting um, sort of the, the face on the right over here of T theta. And then you should take that line segment and stretch it until it hits the curved part of the boundary of the spherical sector. And so that's what this map P does. And so we're, now we're gonna make an eigenvalue problem 
a new eigenvalue problem on um, the spherical sector S theta. And it's going to be um, determined by this weighted sigma Laplacian. And this weight sigma is going to be our original weight tau composed the push out map. And something great happens when you do this, um, you get a radial weight. So this, this exponential function only depends on the radial variable r. Okay, and so now we've, we've cooked up this new eigenvalue problem, which has eigenvalue mu one of the spherical sector. And we wanna argue that this is smaller in some sense than um, the first eigenvalue of the problem on t theta. And so the way we're gonna do this is again by a trial function argument. So remember this function V was um, the eigenfunction on the truncated cone t theta. And so we're gonna make it into a trial function for the spherical sector by composing with um, the push out map P. So then you can use V compose P as a trial function for the first eigenvalue of the spherical sector. And um, so what'll happen is you'll you know, take derivatives of V compose P and you'll wanna do some changes of variables to get you back to T theta. And you'll end up taking um, derivatives of p. And so if you think about what those derivatives are, you find that um, p and the Jacobian of p are both close to the identity. And there's an intuitive way to think about this, um, which is that as theta tends to zero, this um, vertical face of t theta is going to get very close to um, the spherical boundary of the spherical sector. So this means when you do this um, stretch that P does, you only have to stretch a very small amount as theta tends to zero. And so from this, you conclude that the Rayleigh quotient of, on S theta of V composed P is gonna be smaller than um, one plus little o one times the Rayleigh quotient of T theta evaluated on um, the first eigenfunction of that problem. And of course, this quantity is just the first eigenvalue of t theta. So, um, so we've succeeded here. And so uh, one thing I'd like to point out about this technique is that um, this has been used in um, a few other papers before my paper. And one of those was that um, it was used to analyze the Dirichlet eigenvalues of thin triangles by Pedro Freitisch in 2007. Okay, so now, um, uh, so if you think about this problem on S theta, um, you should imagine where um, something nice happened. So our weight sigma is radial and we're on um, not a radial, radially symmetric domain, but we're on a, a spherical sector. So this is good because on sort of the, the cone part of the boundary of the spherical sector, we have Neumann boundary conditions. Um, so what this means is you should think we can take the ground state from that problem and extend it to be a problem um, and extend it to be a ground state on the whole ball if we take sigma, which is radial, and extend it in the obvious way to be a, a weight on the whole ball. OK, so then um, after you've done that sort of extension, um, you can do a, a simple radial rescaling by theta to the minus 1, and then um, if W tilde is that extended ground state, if you divide it by e to the minus alpha r, and you call that function phi, then um, a direct calculation shows that this function phi is, a, is the ground state of um, this Schrodinger operator on this large ball. And this is good for us because this Schrodinger operator does not depend on theta. 
um, and this ball is growing and it's sort of growing to be all of Rn. So you should think about um, um, uh, what this Schrodinger operator looks like on all of Rn. And what you realize is that the first eigenvalue of that Schrodinger operator on Rn can be calculated exactly and it's equal to zero. Um, so this means what you expect is that the first eigenvalue on this ball should converge to the first eigenvalue of the problem on the full space, which is zero, as theta tends to zero. And so um, um, if you're wondering why we know the first eigenvalue of this Schrodinger operator is zero, you should realize that um, we have minus Laplacian minus uh, one over R potential. So this, um, this operator is uh, basically the Schrodinger operator corresponding to the hydrogen atom from quantum mechanics. And so we can do this calculation exactly with some special functions. And so, um, so now to prove this convergence of the problem on the ball to the problem on the full space, um, there's probably more than one way you can do this, but the way I decided to try and do this was with special functions. So, um, so the ground state of this Schrodinger operator on the ball with eigenvalue E has the form, um, this special function M, which is called a confluent hypergeometric function times this decaying exponential. Okay, and so now um, we wanna try and compute what the eigenvalue E does as theta tends to zero. So what you should do is um, you should try and write some formula involving the eigenvalue E. So you should remember on the boundary of the ball, we have some kind of Roban boundary condition. And so if you apply that Roban boundary condition to phi, this will give you um, um, some transcendental equation involving M, our special function. And so this means E will be given by solutions of that transcendental equation. Okay, and if, so if you've seen um, the ODE that defines this confluent hypergeometric function, um, you'll probably remember that the coefficients of that ODE are polynomials. So you can do sort of the usual trick and guess a power series solution and write a power series for um, this function m. And so after some hard work, you can get um, estimates on the coefficients of that power series and um, use the intermediate value theorem on the transcendental equation to get some pretty sharp estimates on the roots of that transcendental equation as theta tends to zero. And so after all that work, what you find is that um, nu one, the, the uh, first eigenvalue of the Schrodinger operator on the ball is negative and it's bounded from below by something exponentially small. And so if you unravel the work we did on the last two slides, what this tells you is that um, lambda one of the double cone minus lambda one of the infinite cone is negative and exponentially small also. And so this was the, um, the difficult lower bound on lambda one of the double cone we were looking for. And so now if you combine this with the upper bound on lambda two that we got earlier and subtract, you find that um, the spectral gap of the double cone is bounded from above by something exponentially small. So, um, so at this point, I was gonna move on to talk about some questions and open problems, um, but are there any questions about the proof at this point? So the actual eigenvalues on these cones are going to minus infinity quite rapidly, aren't they? So it's a, quite a remarkable uh, estimate then if the gap is going to zero. Yeah. Yeah, that's do you, right. Do you actually, so, I guess you know something about the asymptotics uh, as theta goes to zero, is that right? Yeah. Um, 
of the actual eigenvalues rather than the gap. Yeah. Um, yes, that, that's right. So um, for the for the first for this eigenvalue lambda one of the infinite cone, um, you can calculate it exactly because you know the eigenfunction. Yeah. And um, in two dimensions, we know asymptotics for all the eigenvalues, and they basically all behave like um, minus one over theta squared, uh -huh. something like that. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so now I'd like to move on and just um, discuss a, a couple interesting open problems and try and um, connect back to some of the things I talked about at the beginning of the talk. So remember the, um, the Roban gap conjecture says that uh, the spectral gap of a convex domain D with Roban parameter alpha should be bounded below by the spectral gap of the appropriate interval also at Roban parameter alpha. And the conjecture is only for alpha between zero and infinity. And we showed that this connect conjecture cannot be extended to alpha negative. But um, if you look at rectangles, uh, there's um, sort of a uh, interesting perspective on this. So, so for rectangles, um, this inequality holds for all alpha. So if you let alpha be anything you want, positive or negative, and you take a rectangle R, then the spectral gap of the rectangle with Roban parameter alpha is bounded from below by the spectral gap of the appropriate interval with Roban parameter alpha. And this was shown by Richard Logson in 2019. So this sort of um, raises the question, can we extend the Roban gap conjecture to negative values of alpha, but for um, like a, a general subclass of convex domains? So um, something more general than rectangles, but it can't be all convex domains because um, we know the conjecture fails um, for these double cone domains. So I, I don't know if this question has an interesting answer or not, but um, uh, I think it's something interesting to give a little bit of thought to. Okay, and so um, there's also some results in this direction for all values of alpha by Mark Ashbaugh and me from 2020. But um, you have to look at, uh, go to a one-dimensional Schrodinger operator set. So if you take um, a 1D Schrodinger operator with potential V and um, Roban boundary conditions, then we prove that if V is a symmetric single well potential, which means, well, symmetric means it's, uh, even with respect to the center of the interval. And single well means that as you move from left to right across the interval, the potential is first decreasing, then increasing. And for potentials of this kind, um, sort of the natural gap lower bound holds. So the sp spectral gap of the Schrodinger operator with potential V and Roban parameter alpha is bounded from below by the spectral gap of the interval with no potential and Roban parameter alpha. And this holds for all alphas, positive or negative. Okay, and so I wanna finish with um, one more set of interesting open problems in this one dimensional setting. So, so again, you have a one dimensional Schrodinger operator and uh, the problem is to show that if V is a convex or single well potential with center transition point, so, um, so single well with center transition point, again, means that as you move from left to right across the interval, the um, potential is first decreasing, then increasing, but the point where that increasing, decreasing transition occurs is the center point of the interval. And so the problem is to show that, again, um, sort of the natural lower bound on the gap holds for all values of alpha. And in both of these cases, um, we know something for certain ranges of alpha. So when V is convex, we know that um, when alpha is larger than minus one over the length of the interval, we know this inequality holds. And this was shown by Andrews Clutterbuck and Hauer in 2020. 
And for um, V that are single well with center transition point, we know the inequality holds for alpha bigger than zero. And this was shown by Mark Ashbaugh and me in 2020. So um, I think these are both sort of uh, interesting open problems and there's some interesting techniques um, used to prove these things. So, okay. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Derek. Very interesting talk. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is uh, this is a very nice result and nice construction. Um, in the the upper bound, it seems you could probably get away with a rather more general class of domains. Right? It's, that's uh, an easier argument. I mean, you use the symmetry there, but I imagine that's probably not in an essential way. Is that right? Um, you could. You probably just use the uh, exponential decay to to throw away errors if you had two domains which had tips that look like those near the end. I mean, you, you cut off at the moment near one minus epsilon, but I think you could in the upper bound you probably could get away with cutting off even rather close to the tip. Is that right? Um, uh, yeah. So let's go back to that. So. Um, yeah. So. Um, so I kind of wanted to do something sharp, which is why I did the one minus epsilon and you yeah. get this one minus epsilon here. But you're you're certainly right. Um, um, if you know you could you could choose the cutoff to do something else, and you get a slightly different um, rate of decay. Yeah, still going and, to zero. Uh, yeah, yeah. But the the lower bound obviously is much harder. Yeah, that's right. So Julie had a uh, in the, in the chat. Uh, Possibly, if you looked at a class of convex domains where you know that the ground state has a unique, unique critical point, for example, which is obviously not true in this case, if you have a concentration at both ends for the ground state, you must have maxima, you sort of two, at least two maxima there. Um, that might be an interesting class to look at. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, if Julie's still here, uh, what do you what do you mean by critical point exactly? Let's see. Uh, let's see. She is still Ben. Can you unmute Julie? Maybe not. Uh, so the the ground state um, here. Oh, actually, so in the in the negative rebound case, it's not quite so immediately obvious, but. Um, you would expect to have uh, the ground state with a peak somewhere, I suppose, at least on a symmetric domain like a ball. Mm -hmm. uh, in this situation, maybe it's not, a, not clear that you expect any maxima at all, maybe just a single minima, right? Possibly on a domain like this. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I see, yeah. Hmm. Anyway, I, I mean, possibly an easier, kind of question would be if you knew uh, not just a diameter bound, but uh, perhaps an in-radius bound or something like that, you could hope to prove something. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I would imagine something like that is true. Um, but then you have a lot of, uh, yeah. But so, I mean, your result also is much stronger than just a counterexample to our conjecture. So it really says there is actually no lower bound to the gap once you have a negative rebound parameter. Right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's right. Um, yeah. Okay, are there any other questions from people listening? Just raise your hand if so, and, I, and we can unmute you or put a question in the chat. Don't see anything else so far. Um, yeah, and also uh, keep in mind, I think, uh, Ben, I assume we still have a, a, a coffee break after this, is that right? Uh, yes. So yeah, uh, anyone who'd like to come along, come and have a chat. Uh, yeah, everyone should have um, received uh, an email with a link to the coffee break for so yeah. can continue chatting. And there you can actually chat and not have to be unmuted, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 
I will start it in a moment because formally the, this coffee break starts at noon, but I think we can start earlier without any problem. Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, good. I think uh, if there are no other questions, then let's uh, finish the webinar and uh, see uh, as many of you who are, who are as, as are interested in coming at the at the coffee break in a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.